We'll get started and uh, take your Bibles and turn to the Psalm 94. We've been studying that chapter. We uh, got down to verse number 9 and uh, stopped there last week. And you, on your outline there, you'll notice that it just goes down through verse, uh, actually verse 10. And then we were going to give you another outline tonight, but because of the computer problems and printer problems we've been having, we couldn't print another uh, le uh, lesson outline tonight. So I'm going to get you to do this. If you have a pen and a paper, or a pen uh, and a paper, or a pencil and a paper, uh, there you can use your uh, last week's outline. And maybe you didn't get one last week, so you got one tonight. You can turn it over there in just a few minutes, and we'll give you the new outline that we're going to share with you for the concluding part of the chapter that actually goes down through verse verses 10, B, down through verse 23. So before we get started tonight, why don't we talk to the Lord? Father, we thank you for the opportunity once again to study your word. We thank you for those who have come out tonight, the, uh, these adults. Thank you for the boys and girls and their program, the Olympian program. Also the many teenagers over there in the teenage program. And we pray that each one of us will receive something from the word of God tonight. May we realize that he is our teacher and we can learn and we can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. So I pray your blessings now and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I was talking to a person today, and they said, Preacher, I just can't understand the Bible. I said, Well, one of the first things is this. you got to understand, Paul gave us a scripture in the book of 1 Corinthians. It says, The natural mind... The mind receiveth not the things of God, neither can they understand the things of God, for they're spiritually discerned. You can't understand the Bible outside of God. I don't care if you're saved or unsaved. You've got to have the person called the Holy Spirit living within your life. And we find that in John chapter 14, verse 26. It says, when the Spirit of God has come, He will guide you into all truth. He will bring all things into your remembrance whatsoever I've taught you. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. And I told this individual today, I said, before you study Scripture, always ask the teacher to teach you. And I says, that teacher is the Holy Spirit. Now, he may not give you the whole picture right now because you don't teach the same things to a little baby as you do a, 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 a small child or a teenager, adult. You teach the simplistic, the simplistic things of the Scripture. Like, for example, the Bible is called the milk of the Word or the meat of the Word. You don't feed a baby meat, right? You give them milk. And as you grow, then the Lord, you know, adds just the different things in your life. I remember years ago, I did not like vegetables. I, especially, I did not like cauliflower or broccoli, either one. But you know, as a matter of fact, when I was in college, they gave us one day, I thought it was mashed potatoes, Brother Jeff, and it was brock, I mean, uh, cauliflower, because it was covered with cheese. I thought it was mashed potatoes covered with cheese. And boy, it took me a big dip out, you know, it was, it was uh, served uh, kind of family style at the school where we went uh, in the early years of that uh, college. And, uh, boy, I was looking forward to that. I took a bite into that, and you know what happened. I didn't like it. And uh, I didn't like it when I was younger. I didn't like it then. But now I love the stuff. And I think that's because, you know, as you grow, you see what is really needed. And I love, I love broccoli, raw or cooked, you, you name it, or fried or dipped or whatever you want to do with it. I like it, and I like cauliflower. I like any kind of uh, greens or anything like that. I mean, you learn to like things as you grow because you realize, number one, they're good for you. It's the same way with the Bible. The more you grow in the Lord, even the things that kind of rub you the wrong way when God says something, you say, boy, that's for me. I need that. See? That comes through learning and growing in the Lord. And the Holy Spirit is one that teaches us those things. Well, we come back to this chapter tonight. 
And we've been looking into Acts, uh, I mean, excuse me, Acts, Psalm 94. We talked about uh, turning things over to the Lord. You know, we got a habit of trying to carry the whole load ourselves, don't we? We try to deal with things in ourselves. Well, this whole chapter here, the psalmist really wants us to get a hold of the fact of turning it over to God and letting him take care of things. And uh, we'll see the second part of uh, this uh, chapter tonight, uh, how God acts. Are you listening? How God acts or puts, gets into action on how he deals with things in our life that we turn over to him. We're so accustomed to trying to solve things in ourselves and we come to the end of our rope and we, we realize that we need to look to him. After all, that's why he told us in scripture, he says, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And of course, the end result, the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He's not only going to keep that part of our will under control, but he's going to keep that intellectual principle in our minds at the same time. And that comes when we turn things over to him and we permit him to act on them. Now, if you look back at verse number 9 to start out with tonight, I'll read that verse, and then we'll work right on down through the verses. And when we get to the part that you don't have an outline on, I'll I'll give you time to write it down, each of the points of the outline, because it will, trick, it will trickle into your mind a little bit better. Look back at verse 9. He says, He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall, not, shall he not see? Now, that's important because God wants us to understand. He wants us to listen to him because he sees everything we're going through. He sees the details of our life. Matter of fact, listen to this. We only see the past and the immediate, don't we? God sees everything in the future. That's why he wants us to pray about everything. He wants us to tell him about everything. Uh, you remember the little song, Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. We need to tell him about all those things because we don't understand how to deal with them. And after all, he knows all about them. Matter of fact, look at verse 10. It gives us the expansion of the thought of his knowledge. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you believe that God knows all things? Raise your hand. Well, the verse kind of proves that. We could go to many verses tonight. We're not going to. But uh, it'd be good for you just if you have a commentary or if you have a, a concordance in, in the back of your Bible. Many times you can do like a, a, a running, uh, you know, research on that particular thought. But look at verse 10. It says, and I'll come back to the first part in just a few minutes. He that chastiseth the heathen shall not he correct. He that teacheth man knowledge shall not he know? God knows all things. He knows the beginning from the end. By the way, everything in between. See? So that being true, God knows the deepest needs of our life. Uh, so many times, we forget about that verse that my God shall supply all your need. Now, there's some things that we think we need that God knows we don't need. Huh? God knows they would be more harmful to our lives than helpful. So he holds them back. He doesn't give them to us. Reminds me when, my, when we lived in New Jersey. My son was just a little kid now, you know, back then. And uh, he, he always wanted certain things. And one day I walked into the house and he had a big old butcher knife in his hand. And I said, son, give me that knife. And I, I took it. He says, I need that knife. I says, you don't need that knife. Because if you do, it will hurt you. Now, that's the same way it is with God. God knows some things that sometimes we have in our hands, and he takes them out of our hands, and we get, we get mad at God. Uh, we get upset at God because maybe he took those things away from us. Well, he knows what's best. And we need to trust him. We know, he knows the beginning from the end, so he knows everything that, uh, you know, we don't need. He knows everything that we do need. And we need to trust him for it. And so we need to remember that. Now, let me, let me give you the, the lesson tonight, beginning there at verse number 10. 
that will help us and will guide our lives. Uh, verse number 10 and verse number 12 talk about two principles. A principle for the unsaved and a principle for the saved. Now, you say, why is God concerned about the unsaved? Because he created them. Now, you were unsaved at one time. I was unsaved at one time. God created us. We are God's creation. We belong to God by creation. Now, when you get saved, you have two parts of your identification with God. You're not only a creation of God, then you're a child of God. That's a good thing, see. And God does something for a person that's unsaved as well as the saved. Why? Because he cares for us. He knows us. And he cares for us and wants to meet that need. Well, back in verse 10, he's talking about the unsaved person. Let's look at it. All right? It says, He that chastiseth the healing, heathen shall not he correct. Now, the whole principle of chastisement is to correct an individual. Watch this. It's not for punishment. Punishment and correction are in two different categories. Punishment is for evil doers. Correction is for help to a person, whether they're saved or they're unsaved. And so in verse 10 here, God is going to chasten the person. Why? To correct them in an area for help. A lot of people say, God doesn't care for me. Well, God cares for you. And he's going to give you a spanking if you do something wrong. He may correct you to move you in the direction of being saved. Uh, God permits things to come into the unsaved as well as the saved's lives, uh, a saved person's life, to correct them, to help them. You know, you know, a lot of people, they look at God as a big bully. They look at him as one that's beating down on them. You know, carrying his big baseball bat ready to hit them over the head. No, that's, you got the wrong concept of God. Now, we know that there is that side called the justice of God where he will carry a baseball bat, so to speak. He's a judge, see. He's going to be the judge of all mankind. For example, you've heard the story of a, uh, of a man who's not only a, a father to his son, but he also is a judge to the community. And so his son goes out here and he gets in his car and he runs down the highway uh, 100 miles an hour and kills somebody. So he goes before the judge. And guess who he sees there uh, sitting at the judge, judge seat? He sees his daddy. But now he's going to see him in two different lights. He's not going to see him as his dad, but he's going to see him as a judge. And because he's a judge, he has, to, he has to give sentence on the person who has not done what is right, which is right. He's going to have to bring judgment. Well, that's kind of like God is. Yes, God is our Heavenly Father, but He's also the judge, see. And He has to deal with us in judgment sometimes, and will be our judge. And we're not going to get into all that aspect of judgment tonight. That's not the, the uh, you know, the main objective of this lesson. But it is to help us to see God cares for the saved as well as the unsaved. By the way, aren't you glad for 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Do you know that God didn't want anybody to go to hell? Not one person. You see, God cares for us, and he's going to correct us. So he corrects the unsaved. Why? Because he wants them to look in the right direction. Maybe the correction might be to bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ. And it goes on and says, He that teacheth man knowledge, shall not he know it? He gives us a knowledge. Now, let's stop right there a bit. God gives you and I a knowledge before we're saved of the fact that we're lost. And he does that through the conscience. Now, I don't have time to get into it tonight, but if you're taking notes, you can put down there uh, Romans chapter 1. God takes and he wants to deal with mankind to help them to understand, hey, you have a conscience. 
And your conscience is going to tell you when you do wrong. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have done something wrong before you were saved and, and you really you kind of, you felt bad even that you did it? Or you felt guilty? Well, that's the conscience. Now, the conscience is not to be our guide. The conscience is like a law that God gave that shows us when we do wrong. And he corrects us through our conscience. And he wants to show us when we do wrong so we get the thing straightened out. Now, look down at verse number 12. It says, Blessed is a man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. Now the law will judge a person. All right? And in this case, in verse 12, he's talking to the Christian. Notice there are several words that show us that he's talking to a Christian here. He says, Blessed is the man. All right. Now, if we were to go back over to the book of Matthew, chapter number five, he's talking there to the Christian in Matthew, chapter five, and he gives nine times where he says, blessed is the man, blessed is the man, or blessed are those, so forth and so on, because he's talking to the Christian, all right? God blesses a Christian, see? Now, he goes on in that verse, blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth. Now, I want you to take your Bible tonight and turn back to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 12, if you would, please. Hebrews, chapter 12. I want you to see something. Now, this chapter is to a Christian. Hebrews, chapter 12. Uh, I'm glad my dad chastened me or gave me a spanking when I did wrong when I was a kid. You know why? Because he wanted me to do what's right. He wanted the best for my life. My dad loved me. Well, we find that same principle taught here in Hebrews chapter 12. So if you would look down at verse number um, 5. Hebrews chapter 12. Listen to it. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now, if you have your Bible there, read verse 6 with me. For whom... The Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every what? Son. All right, now, you become a son of God or a child of God. They're interchangeable terms. When you get saved, when you trust Jesus Christ as Savior, then you become a child of God. For as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God to them that believe on his name. John chapter 1 verse 12. All right. Now, so he says here, uh, he says, if, he, if you are his child, he's going to chasten you. Why? Because he loves you. He's going he's to chasten you. He's going to scourge you. In other words, what's the difference between chastening and scourging? Chastening may just be with words. Scourging has to do with using an instrument. Now, for years I taught classes on the fact of discipline of children. And you never want to use your hand. You never want to use your hand to discipline your child. Why? The hand or the arm is that part that you love a child with. So you want to use a neutral object. Well, the Bible says a rod. Okay? Spare the rod. Do what? Spoil the child. child. Alright, so you use a neutral object when you're chastening. God uses neutral objects in our lives to chasten us. See, God uses his hand as a hand of punishment. Study that in the Bible. He uses neutral objects to chasten us with because with an arm and a hand, he loves us. By the way, we're in his hand, aren't we? John chapter 10 tells us. We're in his hand and no man can pluck us out of his hand. So he's not going to chasten us, he's not going to chasten us uh, with his hand. He's going to chasten us with a neutral object. All right? It might be something that God, you know, you don't want to be, you, listen, you don't want to spank and that God's going to really have to give you a good one. Uh, it might be a drastic one. Matter of fact, John talks about that in 1 John chapter 5 when he talks about there is a chastening or a sin unto death. God may chasten you to the point he says, okay, that's it, and you're out of here, okay? I'm going to take you on to heaven, see? 
But God chastens you and me. Why? For our good. Now, look back at Hebrews chapter 12 here, and then we'll jump back to Psalm. Look at verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now, he's talking about if you do something wrong, God's going to chasten you. Why? Because he loves you. Then verse 8 says, If ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, speaking of Christians, then are you, are you and he uses the word bastards there, which means illegitimate. Okay, you're not his child, in other words, he said. And not sons. Okay? Now, look at verse 9. Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh, in other words, our earthly fathers, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they, speaking of the earthly father, verily for a few days, chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit. God doesn't chasten you just to be giving you a good spanking. By the way, my dad never, never spanked us without a good reason. Now, I got every spanking I deserved. Every single one of them, I got them, I deserved them. And by the way, I thank my dad. As I, when I got older, I says, I want to thank you for giving me the spank and disciplining me the way I, that you did. Because it kept me out of a lot of trouble. And it helped me to grow up. But there's a right way to chase and there's a wrong way to chase them. We're not, not out for the principle of, of punishment. It's out for the principle of profit. And that's what he says right here. But he for our profit, why? That we might be partakers of his holiness. Correction or chastening has to do with making us, bringing us to that place of being more holy in our life. That is choosing right things in our life that will build our life into a life of godliness and holiness rather than being a person of, uh, uh, that would bring shame upon the name of the Lord. Now, look at verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And then he comes back with a verse in verse 12 that's very important. He says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Why? Because sometimes we don't take chastening serious and we become weary. Now watch this. We give up. We quit. People go away from the Lord. Well, God just doesn't love me. Well, you don't study Scripture. God does love you. God loves you to the nth degree. And he wants the best for us. And so the psalmist, turn back to Psalm 94, that's where we are. He talks about this chastening. For the saved and the unsaved, why? To correct us because he loves us. How many of you believe God loves sinners? Raise your hand. Well, if you don't believe that, you don't believe the Bible because Romans 5, 8 says, but God commendeth. That word commendeth means to show or to prove. God commendeth his love towards us. Listen to this. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God loves you to the nth degree. Uh, if you don't believe God loves you, you haven't read the fam most famous verse in all the Bible, which is on the, on the wall over here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God cares for you and me. And so in this chapter, he's trying to show us that we're to turn things over to him, look to him, that we can be the person he wants us to be. Now, back here in Psalm 94, he says in verse 12, Blesses a man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. Now the law tells us that if you do wrong, Brother Fred, you're going to get spanking. Okay? You, do the, you, 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 you disobey the law, you're going to be dealt with. See? The law never was out, listen, to save us. 
The law was to teach us. The law was to discipline us. The law was to bring us to the knowledge of the truth. You see, folks, listen very carefully. This Bible will never save me. This Bible is to teach me how to get saved. This is God's Word, the law, so to speak, to teach me how I can live a successful life. You say, prove it. All right, you got your Bible? Turn to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8 of the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Did you know that God wants you to be successful in life? Now, I'm not saying God is going to make all of us the same way in our success. Some people say, well, I thought God was going to prosper me and give me a million dollars. Listen, he might give you great health. Isn't your health worth more, worth more than a million dollars? Amen. Huh? Look at verse number 8, Joshua chapter 1. This book of the what? Law, okay? Shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou shalt have good success. You see, God is out for you to be a success and to be prosperous. Now, once again, uh, emphasizing the fact that does not necessarily mean financially. Though God has blessed some people because they have been blessed spiritually, They've been blessed in prosperity as financially. I have some very good, very good friends who are still living. Now, uh, they're, they're not uh, so close that they want to share too much with me. But I have some millionaire friends. And uh, uh, I remember Dr. Marcucci. Dr. Marcucci was a great Italian. Uh, he was an orthodontist in Philadelphia. And Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Marcucci came to me one day and he says, uh, I want to do something special for the Lord. And he says, uh, I'll, I want to give you so much money. And I want you to use it, you know, ever how you want to in regards to a certain ministry. Because I'd ask the people to pray there at the church. We needed a certain amount of money for uh, a project that I was doing for the boys and girls. I was head of the children's ministries at that particular time. And he says, I want to do something. Well, Doc was always doing something like that, Ed. He was always giving money to be able to help an outreach for people to be saved or outreach in this area in the ministry. He used his money wisely for the Lord. And because it was like God just kept giving to him, just kept giving to him. He was never stingy. He always wanted to share everything. He owned a big place, Brother Ed, not too far from our church. But he also owned a home in Philadelphia where he lived most of the time. Because that's where he did, did his orthodontic work. But Dr. Marcucci, he had two big swimming pools. He had a big ten, you know, tennis courts and all this kind of stuff on his property. He didn't use them just for himself. He invited other people. He wanted other people to come. And then he had a chapel. Brother Danny had a chapel where he would have so people could come in and then get preached to. And I've spoken on many occasions. And uh, Dr. Marcucci is in heaven now. But he used his money for the Lord. And I could give you a testimony of many, uh, uh, many men. Doc, uh, 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 Brother DeMoss, who's in heaven. Uh, he had a little book, uh, I forget, The pa P Power for Life or something like that. It was blue. Anyway, he gave those out and he left a, uh, uh, some kind of fun that that could continue to be fun with. And uh, I mean, multi-billionaire, Christian. And he gave, I'm trying to think of how many colleges, Christian colleges, he gave $6 million to each one of those schools as a, as a fund to get kids through uh, Christian colleges. And uh, I know that for a fact because the college where I went, he gave $6 million. And I know several other colleges he gave $6 million. That money was given to be used of the Lord. God blessed him and made him to prosper. You know why? Because he wasn't stingy. A lot of us, we get that money and we, we hoard it ourselves instead of reaching out. You give, say this with me, give and God will give back to you. The Bible says that. Give and it shall be given to you again. Press down, running over. 
Well, God put it into your bosom there, so to speak, the Bible says. Now, let's get back to the scripture here. I'm simply giving you a point here that God wants to bless you if you will permit him to, if you'll put things in his hands, if you'll turn things over to his hands and permit him to act. So the first area on the outline, you flip it over, put this on the back. God will act, number one, by chastening you because he loves you. All right? He will chasten you because he loves you. He loves you so he will correct you. He will help you to live a godly life. See? God wants to do that for your life and he wants to do that for my life if we will permit him to do so. Secondly, God will teach you. All right? Now, God wants to teach you the right things to do in your life. Because he wants you to learn. You see, there's a lot of people that are ever learning and never able to come to the truth. God's objective in his teaching, now look back here if you would, in the verse, uh, there in verse number 12, it says, Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, that's the first thing he does, O Lord, and teaches him out of thy law. Now, let me say something to you very carefully and say it specifically. God cannot teach you if, unless you get into your textbook. This is a textbook God uses to teach you. He wants you to know what he has to say. And by the way, you get this book, you live by the biblical principles that God has given, and I'll tell you what, your life will be a success. You ought to memorize Joshua 1.8 that we read just a little bit earlier. But God wants to teach you. Now, God wants to teach you, number one, by His Holy Spirit. Write down on your notes, John 14, 26. Now, we're going to go back there because of time. But the Holy Spirit, He is our teacher. Now, let's, let's go back and reiterate a statement I said at the very beginning of the lesson. Before you read your Bible, have a short prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. Now, this will work in any area of your life as far as teaching. It'll work on secular things. When I learned this principle, folks, my grades went from down here to up here. I mean, uh, when I was in high school, I thought D stood for dandy. <laughs> and I thought F stood for fine. But that's not what it's ta uh, talking about at all. See, God does want you. And so I asked God to help me. I wasn't a smart kid. And God enabled me to go through five years of college at the university. You say, well, I thought it only took four. It does take five today. That's because I got two degrees there. All right? I went an extra year to get an extra degree. And I've been working on the other. I like, I like one more class uh, to get my master's degree and uh, eight more classes to get my doctorate. But I don't know if I'll ever finish those or not. I'm not interested in dying, in, dying by degrees. <laughs> anyway, to get back to the subject, God wants to teach you and me if we'll permit him. Now watch this. He teaches you daily by you reading the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We grow our faith, number one, by reading the Bible, studying the Bible, meditating on the Bible, and hearing the Bible. Now, this is where a lot of people miss out. I found out the more that I go to church, the more I learn. The more I listen to God's Word, God's Holy Spirit takes and teaches me. A lot of people will absent themselves from God's house because they put the priority in the wrong place. But let me tell you, and I realize this. Let me, let, me, let me step aside here just a minute. I realize there's folks that do have to work. Like tonight, we have folks that would like to be here tonight, but they can't because they're working. All right? But whenever we have an opportunity to be in God's house, we ought to go. See? Why? You want to know? How many of you want to know why? Raise your hand. Wave it at me. All right, turn back to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 25. I'm just trying to give you what I have learned up through the last 50 years that I've been a Christian. 
I know I don't look that old, but it's true, all right? My wife says, now, you, you, you better be quiet. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 25. Hebrews 10, 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of yourse ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's in reference to going to God's house. Assembling meant ecclesia. Ecclesia means a called out group. Okay? Church is a called out group. That's where you get the definition. All right? So it's important for you and I to understand if we're going to let God teach us, we've got to put ourselves in the position of being taught. All right? Now, I don't know about you, but all the years of school that I've had, I found out, Brother Ed, that I learned by sitting down and taking the uh, textbook and studying what I'm supposed to study and reading, doing my reading that I'm supposed to read. And the more you do that, you have the opportunity of learning. That's one way of being taught is by reading. All right? Number two, by studying. Number three, by meditating on what you have studied. We call that also memorization. All right? And then by hearing. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, see. So how are you going if you don't, if you don't get yourself involved in those, th those areas, how do you expect to learn? Do you know this preacher, every day, every day, every day, I let other men teach me. Every day I have devotions, number one, with Charles Stanley. I have devotions with Chuck Swindoll. And I have devotions with Adrian Rogers, who's now in heaven. All right? Now, how do you have them with him? Because they're past things that he's already, you know, did, that he did before he, he passed away. But every day, I have devotions with those three men to have myself taught. You see, just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean that I can't, I'm not supposed to do the same thing that you do. See? I have to learn, too. I love going to preaching, uh, hearing other preachers preach. And I do. I, I like going to revival meetings and Bible conferences. And I, I, I intentionally do it. And my men have, have made a provision by our church to permit me to go for one week of conference every year. And I usually go down to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to the Sword of the Lord Conference. And I hear teaching and preaching all day long for, well, I'm usually there for four days. All right? Why? Because I want to learn the same thing that you do. I want the Holy Spirit to have the opportunity to teach me, see. And so it, it, that's the second thing. If, if we want God to act in our lives, you not only God has to chasten you, but he has got to teach you, see. So take that to heart if you would. Now, look at the next verse there. And I'm going to get back over to Psalm chapter number 94. Look down at verse number 13. Here is the result when you and I let God chasten us and teach us. Look at verse 13. That thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. All right. God during that time wants to give you rest. Do you know you need that rest in the Lord? There is a rest that God gives you in your life when you are willing to let him chasten you when you, you know, when you, if you'll take it in the right attitude, in the right way, and then when you let him teach you. God, you know what the problem of it is? You're like some of us uh, students when we were in college because we probably work, work so much and so forth. We get in class and guess what? We fall asleep. One day I was in uh, one of my classes and Dr. Dykes was uh, the professor. And I was sitting there and I, you know, I, I, was, I was acting like I was, you know, looking at my book. I wasn't looking at my book. I was sleeping. So he, he, he told one of the guys, he says, not Jack guy right there. He's not pulling the wool over my eyes. Well, we're not pulling the wool over God's eyes when we don't listen to what he has to teach us. A lot of us have fallen asleep. 
And we need to keep our ears open and keep our eyes open to what he has to say to us. So God wants to do us. Now, look at verse number uh, 14. The third thing that God does here, he wants to show us that he will not cast us off. I don't know about you, and I, I, I'm going to have to stop here in just a couple minutes. I don't know about you, but I love my kids. How many of you love your kids? Raise your hand. I, I, my kids are grown up now, and uh, I love my grandkids too. Uh, yeah, bring them on. I love them. Okay? But uh, I, I love them. And because I love them, I want to do things for them. And when they come to me, listen, my granddaughters come to me, and my grandsons too, but I see my granddaughters more than my grandsons. My granddaughters come and ask me for something. Jeff, I give it to them. I, mean, I say, how much you want? They haven't quite grown up, so they only say, we'll take a dollar. I say, oh, that's good. I just pulled it out, you know. Now, my grandsons ask me, they say, oh, about 25 bucks. <laughs> Why? Because they, they've grown up a little bit more, see. So, but he says, look, God's going to give you rest. But he's going to do more than that. For the Lord, and we're in Roman number 3 now, if you're putting it down. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. In other words, when you come to God, you can expect God, he's going to do something for your life. He told you, he cares for you, and he's not going to cast you off. Listen, let me make this statement before I close tonight, and we'll pick this up in the next uh, teaching time. God wants you to come and talk to him and ask him for things. You know why? That shows him you are depending on him. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and he that knocketh it shall be opened to him. That's Matthew chapter 7. I believe verse 7 down through verse 8. So here's what I'm saying tonight, folks. Now that we've turned things over to God, let God act in your behalf. And take these th th first three thoughts that I've shared with you, and we'll give you the last, uh, I think there's about four more on my outline, that I'll give you the next time we meet. Now, next week, we'll be meeting on Tuesday night, and we'll have our uh, candlelight service. Don't miss that service. You'll miss a blessing. Bring somebody with you. And we'll have a great time together. And then the following week on a Wednesday, we'll be having our... Uh, New Year's Eve service. So plan to come to both of them, and then that following week we'll come back to Psalm chapter 94. Okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Continue to teach us by your Holy Spirit. Help us have listening ears and a heart of reception, and then feet to carry out that which you've told us to do. We thank you for your word. Bless us. Bless those that are here in this auditorium tonight. Bless our adults who are working with the boys and girls. Bless our adults who are working with our teenagers. And Lord, we pray that you would help each one of us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you would,